A.C. Gilbert developed and distributed a document for every steam and diesel locomotive that was manufactured and in the inventory, a parts list and diagram. Now, I generally refer to these as the factory service manual. They refer to them in part list and diagram. This one is tailored for 343, the 080 switcher from 1957-58 that had the two-position reverse unit uh, on the back of the boiler. These were also available in bound form, either on Amazon or eBay or maybe other sources. I think that's where I got mine was on Amazon. I don't think they're currently available on Amazon, but it never, never hurts to check. But I would certainly check eBay if you wanted to get the spiral bound form of these for all the diesel locomotives and all the steam locomotives. For each, they generally consisted of the cover page, which we'll come back to in just a moment. The second page was an exploded diagram, parts diagram of the locomotive with reference numbers that referenced back to a parts list, which also included the part number that was used by A.C. Gilbert and then a brief description, followed by the same thing for, in, for steam anyway, for the tender and its list of parts, and then the general maintenance recommendation uh, and instructions and usually a wiring diagram for every single locomotive. To me, the most overlooked portion of these factory service manuals is right there on the cover page for every steam and diesel locomotive, and that's the operational specifications. What is specified is the amperage at which these trains should be running. A high amperage could produce things that are non-desirable for the train, especially over time, including elevated heat, and maybe even voltage reduction. Uh, elevated heat, for example, could damage plastic. It could uh, impact wire insulation, including the motors. Uh, the armature has, has already got the reputation of an inability to disperse heat, and it might just simply cause it to even build up greater heat. It can impact lubrication, uh, and it could lead to a degradation in motor performance. Those are just some examples of what increased amperage could do, and that's why I think it is so important to pay attention to these. Now, I'm gonna be operating 343 against these specifications, and what we're gonna be looking at is using a 140-inch oval of track. Now, the oval size ranges. I've seen it go up to like 160, maybe even 180. Um, so it's, but for most steam locomotives, it stays around 140 inches which is your 12 curved sections and two straight sections. So in this one, the motor should be tested uh, to not draw more than 1.55 amps. Now that's the motor, but generally what I focus on is the entire train when it's pulling a consist. So on this test oval, this one specifies that the locomotive has to run at least nine RPM or nine times around the loop within a minute. Uh, and then you could need to do the same thing in reverse. This one says it's 8.5 RPMs within a minute. But notice the bottom line, the load, not to draw more than 2.1 amps while pulling four boxcars. I'm gonna show the resources before we run the test of what I dedicate to performing these tests on these locomotives. And it is including the trackage here you see 12 pieces of curve track. Each is dedicated to testing. I keep them in plastic boxes. I clean them before and after every test and they're built to my specifications. I hand select these uh, pieces of track to make sure that their rail head is extremely smooth and clean. I also clean all pins, polish and shine those, and I also clean the receptacles with mineral spirits. I bend each pin about 20 degrees in the same direction to give better uh, connection to the adjacent piece of track. Now in this test with 140 inches, that's gonna require these 12 curves, but it also requires two straight. Now I'm gonna substitute for the straight track two different sections. One is gonna be a re-railer and the other one is gonna be half, you might say, of a 90 degree crossing. I'm gonna substitute one piece of curve track for the curve section of this switch, this manual switch. 
These three items, the re-railer, the, the switch, and the 90 degree crossing, I also maintain in this dedicated box or location just for testing. All of my rails will be mounted on, are mounted on rubber road bed. I do that to ensure the best possible uh, position for the track, including any slippage, eliminating any slippage along the way or reducing it at least. Now, if you'll look in the description below, you're going to see instructions as to how to see a video. And I wanted to point out to that video to make sure that the person who posted it gets proper credit. You'll actually see a video of a test track in use at the AC Gilbert factory. If you look closely, you'll see on that test track special sections of track. Uh, and you'll see things that are track accessories like uh, uncouplers. Well, I'm not going to put any uncouplers on this one, but I am going to put some special sections of track. I'm unsure that they did that for purposes of testing the power distribution, or they did it to make sure that each locomotive uh, can negotiate all the different types of track without any problem. But nevertheless, in order to emulate what AC Gilbert did, I'm going to use a re-railer for one section of straight, uh, another section of straight, I'm going to substitute to 90 degree crossing, and for one section of curve, the curved part of this switch. I also dedicate for the test a 2B transformer. Now I disassembled this transformer, I thoroughly cleaned it and rebuilt it, all electrical connections, I put in new wiring, uh, everything on it, uh, so that it would possibly be in the best possible condition and not overused. Uh, other things I'm going to use in this particular test because it calls for four box cars is I've carefully selected four box cars from that generation of 1957-58 trains, making sure each is properly lubricated uh, and the gauge is set so that they're not causing any kind of drag or friction on the track, which could increase the amperage, theoretically. And perhaps the most important device that I'll use is the amateur. For this one, I'm going to use a model SF60. And it will be connected to the track with 16 gauge wire to ensure a good voltage flow. Now it'll be connected with spade clips, again, to ensure a good connection to the transformer. So power, uh, will, this will be applied to the uh, transformer at the power feed and it will run from the power feed through the meter down to the track. Nothing in between. It has to be the amateur between the transformer and the track. And then the base post, and I am using a dedicated track clip that I don't use for any other purposes. It's very clean. It's clean before and after each use. And it'll be connected to the base post on the transformer again with another spade clip to ensure good connectivity. So nothing in between the power source and the railhead. With the exception of the locomotive and the four box cars that'll be used as the contest, everything is set up and ready to go on the test track. Please take note of the location of the 90 degree crossing, substituting for one of the straight sections in the 140 inch oval and the uh, <clears throat> switch substituting for one of the curve sections and the re-railer substituting for another. Keep in mind that when you see AC Gilbert's test track, you might see more accessories. For example, a uncoupler. I choose to mount the camera on the floor uh, pointed toward the amateur so that I can go back and review it uh, after the test and take a closer look at it. Uh, rather than trying to observe it while the train is actually running, I'd rather look at the uh, video itself. The pins, the, not the receptacles, but just the pins, and the rail heads were recleaned with mineral spirits, giving those ample opportunity to dry. And note that the emitter is in direct line of the power current that's coming from the transformer. Nothing to interfere with it, nothing in between, and then the base connection comes off of the track clip back directly to the base on the 2B transformer. The trains mounted on the track. It was given one test lap or loop to ensure that there was no obstructions on the track. Now, for, for, for purposes of the actual test, I will mount the camera pointed at the amateur, and then just one corner of, one corner of the image will catch the train, 
That way it can be counted as nine RPMs. But the way I'll conduct the test is to, is to not start the camera, make sure that the train is running at exactly or, precise, or as close as possible to nine RPMs uh, around the loop, and then start the video and the actual test of recording the amateur. Okay, that should give us our nine RPMs. It looks like we're running at about two and a fraction amps for this particular test, two and a fraction amps. After running nine RPMs. Well, we observed two and a fraction amps uh, after running nine RPMs on the track. Uh, the specifications say that the train should not draw more than 2.1 amps while pulling four boxcars. So I'd say we have a pretty sound little locomotive here. I did not test it in reverse, but I think it passes those specifications satisfactorily. And I'm going to pass it on back now to put it on the rail head.